Good evening, participants, and welcome to our session today. As uh, as I was mentioning a little earlier, like it's uh, it's a session uh, where we will be hosting Professor Omar Bertov and his new book, The Butterfly and the Axe. So today's session is the most awaited session and going to be an interesting one uh, because CGC had the opportunity to hold uh, different uh, webinars on different themes, including genocide and Holocaust, which also happens to be one of our research domains. But today's session, we would have a different approach. We would try to understand Holocaust through literature and fiction. As today, we have with us someone who is world's leading authorities on genocide and happens to be very close to CGC, <laughs> who has always been a guide and mentor to us. And uh, yes, that is Professor Omar Bertov. Professor Bertov is a historian who teaches at Brown University and is Samuel Pisser, Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies and John P. Berkland, Distinguished Professor of European History. As a scholar, his distinctive examination and research has directed him to produce 10 books, but today he is here for his latest one, the Butterfly and the Axe, which happens to be not an academic book, but a novel published on 27 January 2023 on the 80th International Holocaust Remembrance Day. For audiences who do not know, The Butterfly and the Axe is Professor Bertov's first English novel, but obviously not his first novel. Uh, Professor Bertov started his career as a writer and authored novels in Hebrew, probably, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Uh, he entered uh, into academics as a military historian and worked on the German army and Nazi indoctrination. He then turned his attention toward the links between war and atrocities. This is how he first became involved with the studies of genocide. And his scholarship focused on inter-ethnic relations in the borderlands of Eastern Europe, sociocultural and microhistory of ethnic coexistence and violence and politics of memory. It is with his family linkage in Western Ukraine, historically Galicia, that inspired him to his in-depth research on the region and involved him work on the, uh, on the borderlands of Europe and also in search of answer, which resulted several publications, most notably Anatomy of a Genocide, the life and death of a town called Bukhazas. The butterfly and the axe is his another approach to present the past through fiction. When I first came across this project of Professor Bertov, I was really intrigued. And I was extremely uh, intrigued because Professor Bertov is, a, I am an ardent reader of Professor Bertov's works when it comes to historical and academic works. But uh, I wanted to discover Professor Bertov's uh, side of a novelist and the literature. So I requested him that no matter how busy we are in the upcoming days, CGC would be very happy to host one session for this novel, The Butterfly and the Axe. And so here we are today. <laughs> so without further delays, I would like to pass on the floor to Professor Bertov to read a few excerpt excerpts from his novel and to present his uh, book before us. Yes, to you, Professor. Great, thank you much. Thank you very much, uh, Sumava, and thank you to everyone who is um, uh, listening. Thank you especially to Leona Toka for being here, and um, I'm really eager to hear her thoughts as well. Uh, what I will try to do um, in the next 40 minutes or so is read some excerpts uh, from the book. And the first one <clears throat> is really uh, at, at the opening of the book and is an attempt to explain what this uh, project actually tries to do. Um, I began thinking about the story some three decades ago when my mother told me about the death of her great-grandfather in Galicia on the eve of World War II. At the age of 97, or 103, depending on the version of the story, he waited for the members of the family to arrive from near and far to bid farewell before he died. 
most of those who came were murdered shortly thereafter in the Holocaust. But no one ever found out the exact circumstances of their death. Years later, when I was writing Anatomy of a Genocide, the book that was just mentioned, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach, which came out in 2018, I was struck by the fact that while I had spent 20 years researching this town as a historian, I ultimately had found nothing about how my own family members living there were murdered. I had recreated the life and death of a town going through thousands of documents and hundreds of testimonies, but my family had been eradicated and erased from the historical record, and there was nothing I could do about it. Yet I felt that I needed to do so in another way. Through my imagination, I needed to provide them with a credible life story within the contours of history. Over the years, I also became increasingly aware that even if I, like so many others across several generations, did not know how my own family had been murdered, that unrecorded event had nevertheless traveled from one generation to another, an unspoken, inexpressible trauma that altered and damaged our psyches. It appeared to me that not only was it necessary to give justice to those who had been killed by imagining their lives and deaths rather than simply noting them, noting that they had occurred, but also that the long-term ramifications of this violence, the trauma that seeped from one generation to another could only be mitigated by returning to the scene of the crime. This book is an attempt to do so. It is therefore neither a work of fiction nor of history, neither a biography nor a conventional novel. It is an attempt to fill in the gaps that the historical record left us to grapple with in ways that respect and conform to information, to information we have, yet transgress the limits of scholarship. It does so by presenting a series of characters who never existed but could have, by linking actual historical figures to imaginary ones and by reconstructing the lives and deaths of actual people in a manner that cannot be supported by documents, but emanates from the little that we do know about them from fragments of stories, rumors, and memories. Because we can never return to the past, and because the past is always experienced and remembered differently by those who populated it, this book tells its story through the perspective of real, and imaginary characters. As a result, when we eventually discover what actually happened, we are left to speculate whether it is the whole truth. The historical truth necessarily lies somewhere in between, never quite resolved and always disputed. In this journey into the past, we learn how one violent event, the murder of a family in a remote Ukrainian village, in the spring of 1944, determined the fate of two families, one Ukrainian and one Jewish, in ways that could not easily be understood by later generations. At the same time, we see how that painful journey into the past, the obsession with finding out what happened, can bring about a modicum of peace and reconciliation. Thus, we can take the bitter fruits of that violence and make understanding possible where previously there was denial and replace hatred with love. Straddling history and fiction, this book acknowledges that historical study as we know it cannot do sufficient justice to those who vanished without a trace. They need to be brought back so as to make history whole. Still, every letter, diary, and testimony reproduced within these pages closely follows a historical source. In that sense, the reader is left wondering what is real and what is fiction. By breaking down the walls of the past, readers can enter a world that was once as real as our own, though it has now largely disappeared from memory and history. For me as an author, as a historian, it is important to keep the ambivalence created by the impossibility of distinguishing 
between what is fact and what is fiction. What I've written is meant to challenge both genres and also my readers. Even if the past can only be reconstructed by imaginary characters within a historical framework, it does not mean that the narrative that the narrative of this retelling is less true than an erratic documentary record that gives no voice to many of the victims of this era. There is no single historical truth after all. So this is my sort of um, brief attempt to uh, explain some of what I try to do in the book. And now I'm going to read some extras from it. I hope you're not hearing too much background noise. Are we, Samama? No, okay, because I am. But <laughs> okay. So the first extract is from a letter by the narrator's mother describing a visit by her aunt Tova from Palestine to their hometown in Galicia, Poland in 1939, where she met her husband's sister, Rochale. Rochale was known as the jewel in the crown because she had married Max, who had an academic degree, a great honor of the time. During the trip, they go together to the village where they'd grown up and where their grandfather had long served as the estate manager. And now I'm, I'm, I read this extra. What became of Max and Rochale in the last years before the war, I know from Tova. I distinctly recall her telling me that she and Rochale had so much in common, though Tova was 24 and Rochale almost 30. Both of them had little girls. Hanale was four and Rochale's Judith was just a year older. And both were married to men who did not quite accomplish what they had set out to do and were made unhappy, not only by their own failures, but also by their wives' disappointment in them. So here were these two women asking themselves where they had gone wrong and if they could still repair the damage, one by leaving, the other by returning. The highlight of Tova's visit was the trip they all made to the family's old village of Niezhin on the banks of the Dniester, or was it the Dnieper? Tova said they were so happy and carefree there, just like children with all their lives still ahead of them, running through the forest, watching the logs flow down the river, playing with the girls on the beach. They would sit by the fireplace late into the night and dream about their futures as if nothing stood between them and their desires, but the darkness of the night that would soon lift with the glorious sunrise over the vast expanse of trees and water. They wandered through the old house where the new estate manager, a young energetic man, keen to modernize the estate, hosted them. He found the old Grafina, that's the Duchess, uh, to be too set in her ways, especially since the passing of her sister. But they got on well with the two sons. Unfortunately, they were mostly away in Lviv and Warsaw and had little interest in farming. This Dmitro and his wife, Oksana, had been great hosts and served them delicious dairy kasha. Our region was famous for its growth from which kasha is made. Oksana was expecting and already a little heavy. She was a young woman with delicate features and a beautiful thick blonde braid. Tova and the rest of the family were not very interested in Dmitro's agricultural plans, least of all Max, who had reluctantly agreed to come with them, but kept seeking opportunities to withdraw somewhere and stick his nose into his book. But they listened because they did not want to offend Mitro, possibly the first Ukrainian to ever manage that old Polish estate. He was so proud to have bought off the Schumers, whose name had been linked to the estate for as long as anyone in the village could remember. Dmitro was actually a Hutzul, one of those people who lived mostly in the mountains. And he told them that up there in the Carpathians, there were very different Jews. Muscle Jews, he called them, who worked as loggers and carpenters and blacksmiths and were just like their neighbors, only that they prayed to the Jewish Lord. Where he came from, he said, everyone was as poor as the next person. 
but all were free and independent. Tova told me that above the fireplace, close to the table where we had celebrated many Shabbat dinners and Passover seders, Dmitro had hung one of the only items he had brought with him from the mountains, a large ax with a broad hand forged blade. It had a beautifully carved long wooden handle and had been in his family for generations. It was a symbol of the tough and proud Hutzul mountain dwelling nation where every man must own a barfka, as he called it, a tool that serves every purpose. It could be a walking stick and a hammer or could be used for cutting down trees or fending off wild beasts and robbers. He took the barka off the wall and let the guests touch it. In the afternoon, one of the stable boys, Mikhailo, a nice but taciturn lad, wearing clothes so tattered that they seemed to be made from discarded rags and walking barefoot, took them across the meadow toward the Grafina's house. They met her, her two sons, Vwadek and Yanek, who were there with their families over the summer. They were tall, elegantly dressed middle-aged men, very different from Tova and Rochale's husbands, the doting old revolutionary and the downcast scholar. They reminisced about the days when they were boys on the estate, playing soccer on the village green with the two Schumer boys. Leaning on their walking canes and smoking long pipes, Vwadek and Yannick asked how Yaakov and Adolf were doing in Palestine. They did well to leave, they said. This place is going to the dogs. Behind them, the mansion was visibly falling apart with its plaster peeling and some of the window panes missing. The garden was covered with weeds and the general impression was that of a charming Italian ruin you see in travel books, not a dwelling for aristocrats. There were butterflies everywhere, of all colors and shapes, flying up and down in unison like a vast multicolored blanket as the little girls chased them across the meadow. They had quickly become firm friends and were utterly happy together. Hanale was heartbroken when they eventually had to board the train for the long journey back, passing through endless fields heavy with grain and vast forests stretching as far as the eye could see. From the train window, they waved to village girls leading cows to pasture. The geese were running alongside the railroad tracks and Hanale cried and cried as if they would never see them again. They never did. So that's the first extract I wanted to read to you. The second takes us uh, uh, much further in time. Uh, so the abstract I read you now is uh, about Tali, who is Tova's granddaughter. And she tells the narrator about her visit in 2003 to that same family village of Miezhin, together with Andri. Andri is a British man, uh, Andy is called in Britain, uh, a British man of Ukrainian origins. And she tells what they discover there. Less than a mile from the village, we turned right onto a dirt road and spent the next hour bumping along it, driving in and out of patches of forest and farmland with fleeting glimpses of the diester to our right. Finally, a rusty metal sign indicated that we had arrived. Throughout the drive, we had hardly exchanged a word. Andri drove slowly into the village, a single street of small houses on either side with fields stretching out behind them. Andre rolled down his window and spoke with an old man walking down the street. The man became quite animated. Then he got into the back seat and began giving Andre directions. Our path took us toward the patch of forest, separating the village from the river. In front of us were the ruins of a mansion surrounded by tall trees. The roof had caved in and the vegetation had taken over the interior. Our friend, Mikola, tells me that this is where the Polish estate owner and her sons lived when he was a boy, said Andrei. 
My grandfather worked here as a stable boy. He stopped the car and we got out. There was a wonderful smell in the air of pine, soil, and food being cooked. Across the dirt road from the mansion, there were a few low houses. This must have been the estate manager's house, Andri said, when we reached the spot. The houses were all abandoned. Why is no one living here? I asked. The old man had stayed by the car and I could see now and I could now hear him calling out to us. I turned back and saw him pointing at one of the houses and gesturing, passing a finger across his throat. And I could not quite tell whether he was grinning or expressing horror. What is he saying? I asked Andre. He says that there was a murder here and people are afraid to come to the spot. They say it brings bad luck. Who was murdered? When did it happen? Mikola lit a cigarette, coughed, and spat on the ground. Ask him, I insisted. We should go back to the village, Andre said. I don't think he likes us being here. Let me just walk around a bit. This is where my family came from, I said. Andri looked surprised. I thought they came from Porushenia. My grandfather, Adolf, was born and grew up right here on the estate, as apparently did yours. It had become warmer, and one could almost sense that spring was around the corner. We walked over to the large house in the yard, which seemed to have withstood the ravages of time better than the mansion. I tried the door. It was unlocked, and we walked slowly into the dark interior of an almost empty room. They were afraid of ghosts, said Andri, but they took all the furniture. There was a large fireplace at one end. Above it hung a large axe with a beautifully decorated handle. That's weird, Andri said. You would have thought that the peasants wouldn't have left this behind. I don't like this place, I said. It feels creepy. Let's get out. There was a gust of wind and the door slammed shut. All I could see was the blade of the ax shining on the wall. I held Andri's arm. Let's go, I insisted. We made our way back to the car where Mikola was patiently waiting, smoking a cigarette. Hey, look, I called out. A beautiful large butterfly was hovering over the bushes by the car. A harbinger of spring, Andre answered. We drove back to the village where Mikola insisted that we join him for a glass of vodka. We sat in the tiny enclosed porch of his house, which seemed to have only one large room. He was a wiry man with a deeply creased face and bright blue eyes. He smelt of sweat, alcohol, and tobacco. His wife, a large woman, brought out a tray with vodka and glasses a loaf of bread and a jar of honey. The sun streamed through a filter of finely woven curtains, casting geometrical shapes on the table. Outside, chickens pecked in the yard. We raised our glasses. I told them that your family once lived here, said Andri. They're very happy that you have come to visit. I thanked them and asked if they remember my family. No, Andri said, they were little children during the war. People in the village say that the Polish owners always had a Jew to manage their estate. But just before the war, the Jews left and the estate was managed by someone from the Carpathians, a Hutul. Do they know what happened here? Mikola poured another round, but Andri refused. I told him that I have a long drive ahead, he said. Mikola lit a cigarette and talked for a while. I did not want to interrupt him and waited until it finished. As we left the house, we saw that neighbors had gathered on the street, eager to watch these unlikely visitors. We got into the car and drove off, taking with us Mikola's lingering order. What did he tell you? As we bumped along the dirt road, I felt lightheaded from the two shots of vodka. Mikola told me that when the Germans came, the estate manager was a Hutu, whose name may have been Dmitro. The Polish owner, the Grafina, had died, and her sons had been deported by the Soviets. So Dmitro managed the estate, convinced that the sons would eventually come back to reclaim their property. But people in the village thought that this was just an excuse to take over the Polish property.
The Mitzvah had twins, two babies born just after the war began. The Soviets didn't mind him taking care of the farm, but for a while, some of their men stayed in the mansion and messed it up. A bit later, when the Soviets fled from the Germans, they took with them most of the furniture and any valuables they could lay their hands on. No self-respecting German would have wanted to stay in this ransacked hole in the wall, so they left Mithra in the village in peace. The villagers were jealous of this Hutu because he had so much land and livestock and could do whatever he wanted now that his masters were gone. He never moved into the big house. A few months before the Soviets returned, a rumor started going around the village that Dmitro was hiding Jews on the estate. By then there had already been many killings of Jews in the area, but Meren, that's the Ukrainian name of Miezhen, hadn't had any Jews since your grandfather sold his house to Dmitro. People heard about Jews being killed in nearby town, but that had not affected their own lives, apart from the fact that since the Germans arrived, there were no Jews to buy their produce. Instead, they had to bring it to the market themselves. And market days in towns such as Porushenia were very different after the Germans came. In any case, it was after most of the nearby Jews had been killed that those rumors began circulating about Mithro hiding Jews. People said, this cunning Hutsu, not only has he taken over the Polish estate, now he's making a fortune from the Jews he's hiding. He gets rich while we are getting poor. Other people worried that Mithra's actions would put the whole village in jeopardy and that all the houses would be burned down if the Germans or the Ukrainian police found out. But no one denounced him. In the end, Dmitro himself was at the root of what happened, said Nikola. In spring 1944, Andrei continued, when the Germans began their retreat from the area, the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, took up positions in many remote villages. And one company, Mikola was sure it was a Waffen SS unit, established itself in the village. The company commander and his staff set themselves up in the old mansion. This was very dangerous. By now, everyone knew that Mitro was hiding a Jewish family under the Germans' noses, because just weeks before the SS arrived in the village, the Jewish family had been blessed with a baby, and the farm laborers who lived nearby could hear the cries of the woman who delivered it. They soon established that this family was made up of a young couple, a little girl, and a baby who was delivered in Dmitro's house with the help of his wife. No one knows exactly what happened, but when the SS company relocated, the Hutzel and his family disappeared, and no trace was found of the Jewish family Dmitro had allegedly hidden in the barn. And since the Germans had burned down the barn, as part of the scorched earth policy they implemented everywhere as they retreated, it was impossible to confirm whether there had in fact been any Jews there in the first place. Some people thought it was just a malicious rumor as no one had ever seen them. But then why did the Hutsu take his family and flee, leaving behind all their property? Was he afraid of Jewish revenge now that the communists were returning? So now we are moving to another uh, um, extract, and that is from, uh, sorry, uh, I wrote the year. Uh, yes. Uh, and this extract is uh, taken from Mikhailo's confession. Mikhailo is this peasant boy that we met, uh, who happens to also be uh, the grandfather of Andri. And uh, after Mikhailo dies, uh, Andri finds that he left him a confession. Uh, and that is in 2016. And that confession is about the murder of Rochel and Max and their children in the spring of 1944. Gradually the darkness lifted and I could see that the Germans were, were ready to go. The commander came out of the villa and got into the car. He drove toward the village where the rest of the unit was billeted, followed by the big truck. For a moment, the sound of their engines filled the air. Then it grew still again. I looked around the yard. 
It was a beautiful spring morning and bird song filled the air. It was still very cold though. A large butterfly was hovering close to the ground and then perhaps carried by a light breeze glided almost to the top of the barn. At that moment, I distinctly heard the cry of a baby, rapidly smothered. It almost certainly came from inside the barn. They're in the hayloft, I thought. Go up there and take care of them. I heard Stepan's baritone behind me. I turned around and there they were, the whole group, armed to the teeth. I jumped to my feet. Can you handle this pistol? Stepan handed me a German Luger. We'll make sure the Hutzel doesn't get in the way. Do you want me to kill them? I asked, trying to sound as calm as I could. Of course, why do you think we're here? Do you want to be a fighter or a stable boy? I've never fired a weapon in my life, I answered, handing back the pistol. Then I heard the door of the estate manager's house open and saw Dmitro stepping out. He was holding his ax. What are you doing on my property? He called out. You'd better leave right now. And let go of that boy too, he added, when he saw me behind Stepan's back. You're hiding Jews here, Stepan said calmly. How dare you accuse me of that, Mitro responded. Do you think I'd hide Jews when the Germans are everywhere? Well, said Stepan, now the Germans are gone, so you should have no worries about letting them go. I will do as I please on my property, Mitro answered, and started walking toward us, the wide blade of his ax glittering in the early morning sun. I know who you are, he said to Stepan as he came closer. You are that no good bastard who squealed about your own people to the Bolsheviks, and now you're playing at being a hero again. Two shots rang out, and Mitro fell lifelessly on the ground, still holding his axe. You should really learn how to use this Luger, Stepan said, observing his pistol. The Germans make damn good weapons. But since you can't use firearms, you'd better take the axe. I'm sure you know how to handle that. I walked over to Dmitro's slumped body. His head was a bloody mess. You could not see his face. In the distance, I could hear someone shrieking. It must be Oksana, I thought. I felt nothing, as if my insides had frozen. The other guys were joking around, making fun of that stupid peasant and his ax. He was holding onto it so tightly that I had difficulty extracting it from his hand. Finally, I stood up, holding the ax in both hands. It was a beautiful tool with a large broad blade and an intricately carved wooden handle, now spattered with Mitro's blood. Oksana was screaming my name in the distance. Go over there and shut that woman up, Stepan said to one of his men. Now get on with it. We don't have all day, he said, turning to me. He was still holding the Luger, tilting it this way and that, as if to see whether it was well balanced. I walked over to the barn door and pulled out the wooden bar. A couple of shots rang out behind me, and Oksana's screams now turned into something I had never heard before, like cries from a wild beast whose limbs were being torn apart. You can go and play too, boys, Stepan said to the other men. I'll keep watch over the stable boy. I walked into the dark barn. It was cooler inside and smelt of manure and fresh hay. I let my eyes get used to the darkness and saw a ladder at the far end, its top part leaning onto the hayloft. I slowly approached it. Just before I reached it, someone leaped at me from behind a bundle of hay. I swung at him with the ax and heard a dull sound as the blade hit his head. He died without a whimper. It was a middle-aged man, quite thin, he had no shoes on and smelt of urine, excrement, and sweat. I had literally split his head in half. In the light increasingly streaming from the barn into the barn from the narrow opening, openings at the top, I could see a pair of round glasses on the floor a few feet away from him. I stuck the handle of the ax into my belt and climbed slowly up the ladder. And I'll conclude with two very short extracts. Um, the first is the closing pages 
uh, from the diary of Judith, that's Rochale's daughter, which was collected at the site of the murder by Mikhailo, and that's in 1944, and was dis discovered by the narrator in a Polish archive in 2019. This morning I woke up very early because I heard a noise outside. Father and mama are sleeping. Mama is holding David to her breast. It is very stuffy in the hayloft. I'm itching all over from the lice. I looked out through the crack. A big truck came from the village. The Germans were shouting. Then they got into the automobiles and drove away. I couldn't believe my eyes. I stood on a haystack and opened the hatch in the ceiling. The cold air made me gasp. The darkness was lifting. There was not a cloud in the sky. It was very still and quiet. A large butterfly flew up toward me and I was jealous of it for being so free when I am locked inside. Now I will go back to sleep and write more later. I'm very hungry, but soon we will be free. And the very last extract, I said, is the uh, closing words by the narrator. In February, 2020, just as the first news of the pandemic was beginning to filter through, I had a last communication from Tali. She was writing from Lviv, where Andri was spending his sabbatical year. They were living together. For the next few months, I assumed that the pandemic had made it impossible for them to leave. Perhaps I thought they would stay together in Galicia, where we all once came from. Her last words to me were, I finally come home. That was what her mother had wanted. But I was skeptical. After all those years of wandering, would Tali be able to stay in that land of buried memories and unmarked mass graves? But we lost touch. Then history came back and Russia invaded Ukraine. Now even the dead could not rest in peace. I was anxious to hear from Tali, but no word came. A friend wrote me from Israel that her son, a paramedic who volunteered to help refugees, had apparently seen Tali in Przemyshin, astride the Polish-Ukrainian border, caring for evacuated Ukrainian orphans. Did Andriy go to fight to save Ukraine, to make his grandfather proud? The world had turned around again. And once more, millions of people were losing their homes. Entire cities were in ruins. At least she tried, I thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, for such a marvelous uh, presentation, Professor, and the excerpts which you took were excellent. Thank you for the readings, and uh, it's a really interesting novel I had been reading, and I'm sure everyone would like it, because as you mentioned, like it's a sort of uh, history and fiction, both mixed, and th that is what it, it, it makes it more incredible. So... Yeah, we would be, we, we will open the floor for discussion and uh, audiences are requested to drop their questions in the chat box. But before that, uh, today we also have with us in the panel, Professor Leona Talker, our other guest. Professor Talker is Professor Emerita of English Literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She is a famous author and scholar whose research interests focus on Holocaust and genocide fiction. Her notable publications include Return from Archipelago, Narratives of Gulag Survivors, Gulag Literature and the Literature of Nazi Camps, uh, Intercontextual Reading, and many others. She is one of the readers to read Professor Bertov's novel and also provide uh, her advanced praise for uh, Professor's work. And I would like to go to her for her commentary and then we can start our discussion. Over to you, Leona. Thank you, Sumava. <clears throat> I would like to start with the genre of this novel, uh, which is a very good read. And when I read it, I couldn't, couldn't put it down because it 
among other things, it creates suspense and it creates atmosphere. Um, it is uh, uh, the genre of autofiction, which is rather widespread these days. Or uh, autofiction is variously defined, but um, it can extend to this novel as well. It combines autobiographical points with fictionalization and uh, real people with uh, fictional figures. So this is what is done in this novel. Autofiction, as my colleague David Hadar uh, uh, has put it, uh, has become so popular because people are uh, concerned with the relationship or rather the tension between life and work. And very many of uh, works written in this genre precisely deal with that uh, tense relationship between life and work. Now in this novel, there is no tension. Both life and work converge together to put the author on this quest for what happened uh, to a specific family. And it is, to some extent, a historian's dream, finding the sources, filling in a gap. And of course, it's also uh, a personal desire to know what happened. Uh, I would dearly love to know what happened to some of the members of my family two generations back, and it's impossible. Now, uh, those who have read Anatoly Kuznetsov's novel in the form of the document called Babi Yar, see that it ends in a rather optimistic statement. The Germans wanted to cover up everything and to keep their crimes uh, secret that nobody should know, but there will always be some Aunt Masha who happened to be not far and who will uh, eventually testify. That is also wishful thinking because so very often there is no Aunt Masha and there is no document and there is no confession. Okay, so the novel uh, basically imagines uh, the presence of the documents of the confession. And even so, as uh, the historian later on applies his analysis to the confession, he shows that even that confession cannot be completely trusted because the confession is uh, uh, self-protective and uh, maybe skewing the facts, always representing uh, the person who is confessing the criminal actually as blaming everybody else except himself, always somebody else has started or has provoked, etc. And he very conveniently uh, glides over the fact that he was the one who betrayed that Putzul that Dmitro for, for purposes of his own to a bunch of uh, murderers. So uh, he keeps telling and telling and telling so as if hoping that we should forget that uh, moment, but it does not get forgotten. Now, um, I've done a lot of work on um, literature works written by people who were there, so to say, uh, first-hand witnesses, flesh witnesses, as Harari puts it, uh, those who have experienced what they're writing about, but they write fictionalized narratives. And there are certain conditions under which these fictional narratives can be used or read as historical testimony despite the fact that there is a clear like like the as if convention in them it is as if uh, 
this happened to a third person character who dies in the end or to a first person character who has uh, not seen the events and so on. But they represent the events in such a way that uh, they strike one as a sample of what happened, as typical, more or less. And this sample convention uh, goes a long way towards canceling the as if convention. In other words, these things happened. The crimes were serial. If they didn't happen to A or B, they happened to C. Things happened these ways, this way. But there is one more moment here. Not everything is typical. Because in the story that we have been dealing with, the typical event is the mass killing of Jews in shallow graves that they have themselves been made to dig. And um, uh, this is also mentioned by some of the characters of the novel, uh, women stroking their children's hair before this uh, passage to the Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of the name as it is sometimes called. Um, that is the typical event. A novel uh, usually likes to deal with the events that maybe not so much typical as typifying in the sense that such events could happen only in a particular time and space. So they characterize the tragedy, they characterize the social setting, not by presenting something that happened to most people, to ordinary people, but that could have been made possible by uh, these particular circumstances. And this is what we also have in this novel. Uh, the heroine who gets killed is the jewel of the crown, uh, the most beloved of the family. Uh, the family gets killed when the Germans already move away. They have been sheltered by a person who actually did not did not really want their property, did it out of the goodness of his heart. Um, they were sheltered while all the others or so many others were killed. So these are special cases. These are rather extraordinary cases. And as we know, the extraordinary uh, is now more or less a substitution for the supernatural. We don't want supernatural anymore. But fiction thrives on, on, on it, extraordinary cases. And all the same, these extraordinary cases reflect a certain, uh, a certain stage, certain juncture in our historical knowledge, including the fact that the family is killed, this particular family, is killed not by the Germans, but by the neighbors, okay? And here, the whole scandal about Jan Gross's book called Neighbors uh, plays a role. Um, so uh, not so much the typical as the typifying. And the book is rather honest, quite honest about the fact that this is fiction. It doesn't let us forget it. And the way it reminds us of it is by using basically the modernist style of writing, similar to some of the works by Faulkner. Uh, a modernist narrative, which is not um, imitating uh, the factual memory narratives uh, that are usually uh, much more conventional. Okay, and maybe there is also a touch of Zebald with the photographs used. Um, so um, I, let me add my recommendation to those who have not yet read the book. It's it's a good read. I want to ask Omer by way of concluding. You know, as a literary scholar, 
mainly working on English and American novel. Uh, things are supposed to have a function. What is the function of a character called Yef Hen in your uh, novel? That's the character who leads Tali and um, Andri uh, through the town and shows them where the Jewish places were. Yeah, thank you, Leona, first of all, for for this, uh, for your comments, um, which I really take to heart. I think, um, I, I, I mean, I'd like, like, like often is the case, I think you understood what I was trying to do better than I did. Um, and I just want to say hi to somebody that I show that I saw sh showed up. Uh, uh, um, Jay Winter. Hi, Jay. I haven't seen Jay in a very long time. Um, the Yevhan for me is um, like in a lot of what I write in this novel. So it's both based on something that occurred to me in Buchach, which was almost like an apparition uh, of someone who actually showed up. Uh, some strange character from the town uh, and it serves a purpose for me in the book uh, in the sense that when we come to these places um, we know a lot about them and we know nothing about them uh, we come to a place that uh, looks like the place that we read on that we were told about but they don't look like that um, because what we read about them, what we were told by family members or from more kind of memorial books is not the place as it is now. And so there's a divide between our uh, um, confrontation with the place as it is now and what we um, were expected to see. And how do we get through that separation between one and the other? And Yevhen, in, in that sense, takes you through that, but he also does it not directly. That is, he takes uh, the visitors to certain sites, but what he tells them is not something that he experienced or remembered because he's not old enough. So he tells it through what he heard from his mother. And he expresses at some point a certain question as to what did what his mother tell him was it something that she heard or was it something that she herself saw and if she saw was she actually a bystander watching out of curiosity the process of killing the Jewish community in her own village so he, he is a kind of connection between the visitors at the time their own, what they brought with them as a memory, as a, 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 not their own memory, but a transmitted memory, and the town as it is now through his eyes and how he heard about what it was in the past. Uh, so I, I see him as a, as a kind of link between the two. But he also has a certain strangeness to him, of course. Uh, he is untypical, as you say, uh, when rarely, runs into people like that. He knows various languages uh, for reasons that may be true or not. Um, and so in that sense, he there is something unreal about it. And I like that uh, in the sense that the, the town as it is and the past as it occurred is so stark and so um, painful that this kind of character who pops out of nowhere uh, humanizes it um, in a way that often people who come to these towns as visitors uh, do not. I'll, I'll add one thing uh, about my own experience. I mean, a lot of people go to these places, to these towns, a lot of Jewish visitors from Israel, from the United States, they come in big air conditioned buses they they step down, they look at the place, and then they leave. And they they often look for what kind of Jewish life there had been there, and then maybe the mass graves of the 
if they can find them, often they are unmarked and impossible to find. They have no contact with the population, with the current population. So they, um, you know, they, they sort of drop in and then drop out. I didn't travel that way. I always travel there with Ukrainians. Um, and, and in that sense, I, I, I had this double perspective or more than double perspective of the, of the place, of the Ukrainians who were traveling with me, with their stories and their memories and my own. And then of course, the, the way the place was and the way the place had been. And so for me, Yevhen also has that um, aspect to him that he is of the place, that he's part of that. And you're not only seeing it through the eyes of the visitor who is an outsider, and really is looking only for what happened scores of years before that. I don't, I don't know if that explains it, but that, that's the way I can think about this character. Yes, but there's just one more thing about the typical fate of the Jews of the town. It yes. is he who tells. Yes, the book. yes. He Yes, yes. He 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 tells the typical fate. The the typical fate. He tells it through his mother's story, and in some ways, she is typical in that the population often went to see what it looked like and 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 remembered, but not often reported it later on. Um, so he does do that, but but he does it with the degree, with a degree of empathy that that one does encounter but that has to be evoked that doesn't emerge like he does so if you actually manage to sit down or manage because it's too late now but if 20 years ago you could sit with people who had experience who had seen these events who knew the people were being killed they were not only neighbors doing killing they were also neighbors who were friends uh, and yet who were onlookers and often profited from subsequently from the murders just by taking over property. Uh, so there was a mix of empathy and, um, and a, a, a reluctance to speak about it. And you had to touch something for sometimes that to emerge, that story of the people you knew and the memory of them actually being murdered in, right in front of you. Uh, and so he does give the typical story, but the typical story is not, is typical and not typical at the same time. It's typical in the sense that that's how the Germans killed the Jews. And it's untypical in the sense that we sometimes have difficulty in understanding the relationship within those communities between the Jews and the non-Jews. And I think that he sort of brings it uh, a bit more to the surface than you you would see when you're watching through your you know your air conditioned buses windows. Mention something that I have very recently discovered: a collection of poetry by Mariana Kianowska, who tries to imagine the experience of the murdered in Babi Yar from within. Yeah. What uh, Kuznetsov, Arlene also wrote an excellent article. Arlene Ionescu is here, wrote an excellent article on Kuznetsov's uh, book. Uh, but he does not try to imagine what it was like for the individuals, for each one in his or her circumstances. And here is this woman uh, in 2018, who writes poems in which she tries to imagine separate individual cases and and how they felt about it. Oh. Yeah, and it is the voices, you know, this is what um, Primo Levi wrote, right? I mean, these are the witnesses who could not bear witness, uh, those who are uh, from within, those who survived, uh, as he wrote in his last writings, uh, are not typical. Uh, those who bear witness are not typical because most people were murdered and they were not there to tell their story. Uh, and, and, and I have to say there is, 
and I thought about it a great deal. Uh, there is a question as to whether we, um, or I as an author, um, have the right to do that. Um, is this something, is it ethically acceptable um, to tell their story for them? Um, and, and to say, as I do, as you mentioned, I don't hide it, that I'm imagining it. This is not real documents, that they're invented documents. And I think that there's some who will object to that and, and will say you, for an event like that, you should o only stick to the documentation because otherwise, once you start fiction, then you open the whole can of worms of what actually happened because the events that happened were so horrifying and so, as some have argued, impossible to represent, uh, you're saying, well, what is the difference between fiction and history? Then if you can imagine it, why should we believe what we are told is actual fact? And I can understand that objection. As I say, and as I read here at the beginning, my argument is that uh, there's so such a huge injustice to the fact that so many people were just sucked into this oblivion and disappeared. Their lives, their memories, their stories, and that I felt an obligation to at least try to tell the story of some people. Uh, all, all I knew about them were a few words that my mother told me just the fragments of stories, memories, and, and the many other characters in the novel that also she mentioned in passing. And I thought, but who were these people and how did they die? And how is it possible that all we know about them is like this um, great uncle of mine, Shimon, who played the violin. That's all we know about him. He learned to play the violin in Prague and then he used to play in World War I and then he used to play in family gatherings. And then he was killed with his children and wife. And we know nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and, and so there is a tension between um, fictionalizing uh, and erasing. And um, you can tilt in one direction or tilt in the other. And I have usually tilted in the direction of the historian of only writing what I can document. Um, but I felt at some point that the, the history has vast limitations when you write about such events. Uh, and I thought, at least for myself, that I needed to try something else as well. Exactly. And Professor, like uh, one more character, which, you know, I found very interesting in your book, and that is uh, the narrator, uh, uh, the character of the narrator, because I felt to some extent the character of the narrator is very deep. And uh, I also resonated it with uh, a character named Amir. He was a character in the, the kite runner of Khaled Hosseini's novel. So this, uh, similarly, uh, why I, I mentioned this, because the kite runner who, uh, who in, in which Amir was narrator, like he mentions about his life in Afghanistan, and the, his family's plight, and then again returning to Afghanistan, which was then Taliban occupied, and then he encounters past. So these sort of things, the character to some ex extent resonated uh, Khaled Hosseini himself, and even the author himself agreed to that. So like, I'm just curious to know, like, uh, is it uh, like uh, is your is your narrator to some extent resonate with Omar Bhattu? I mean you and why did you keep it anonymous and mis mysteriously unnamed in your book? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, so yes, obviously the narrator has uh, sort of overlaps in parts with myself, um, but first of all. Uh, other characters um, also uh, have parts of me in them. Um, and so the, the author divides, this author divides himself among several characters, not only one. Uh, the, the, the role of the narrator in this book for me is 
in large part based on the tension that I was just uh, talking about now. That is, the narrator is a historian. And, and he says it at certain points, you know, he believes in fact. Um, he, he is suspicious of anything that is not factual. He wants empirical fact. Uh, but he encounters this situation where more and more fragments of a past that had affected him starts floating to the surface. And he does not know quite how to deal with that. Uh, and in that sense, he is your, I'd say, um, 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 your, your example of an empirical, somewhat detached, emotionally somewhat detached, uh, but also um, as a scholar, someone who believes in detachment between uh, what he analyzes, what he tries to reconstruct, and his own emotions, right? And his own self, uh, believing that that is the right kind of critical distance that one needs in order to understand a certain past. But the past that he encounters is a past that is very hard to document, and yet that uh, has a particular effect on him. And because it's difficult for him to even confront that, to confront the effect of that past on himself, he can see it only through its effect on others. So in a sense for him, Tali, with whom he, for whom he has growing affection, uh, is the vehicle through which he can begin to also think about his own feelings, uh, not simply his critical analysis of documents, but how what was documented or was insufficiently documented influenced him. Uh, so in that sense, he's, he's the, 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 uh, the way I thought for many years and the way I was trained as an historian, uh, he, he is the one who says, okay, I don't want to hear any grandmother's tall tales. Give me facts. If there are no facts, I don't like characters in, histo in, in history books that say things that I know cannot be documented. Napoleon says, uh, I wanted to do this or that. Give me the document that says that. If not, don't put words in his mouth, right? So that's the kind of very, at the same time, we are all uh, affected by history, by our own history, uh, and in particular, if you are someone who dedicated much of his life to writing about genocide and atrocity, you cannot but be affected by that. And at some point, when you start asking yourself, why have you done it for all those years? And you begin to think that it, it, it's, it's a story also of your own family. And you didn't go there in order to tell the story of your family but the story of your family affected you over time. Uh, so you, you reach a certain point where you have objective reality, uh, detached analysis, and then something that is happening to the person himself. And I was interested in seeing how the narrator gradually and very reluctantly moves along this path. As Leona was saying, even when he's confronted with the Mikhailo's confession, he says, yeah, that's great. This confession is very interesting, but is it true what he's saying? So he's always asking these questions and yet he, he cannot but be moved by the story itself because he's implicated in it. Also coming to the, the documentation part, which uh, uh, is the basis uh, of this book. Like, I mean, uh, there is uh, this gap and that is why you had to take the help of fiction, which is one of the best method. But uh, you have been to this region, Bucha, uh, Bucha uh, uh, many times. So did you find any sort of documentation relating to your family? Uh, uh, was it? like available some sort of, if you could say, yeah. Yeah, so you know, that's the, uh, 
in the last three chapters of my recent academic book, uh, Tales from the Borderlands, I um, reconstruct my conversation with my mother in 1995, uh, in which she provides many of the very few memories on which I based the novel. Uh, and at some point I ask her there, so do we know what happened to those, to the members of the family who stayed behind, which was most, right? Most of my family remained there. She came to Palestine with her parents and two brothers and that's it. Everybody else was murdered. And she says to me, well, that's it. We know nothing, nothing, no news ever came. Uh, and so when I went to do research there, although as a historian, I kept telling myself, I'm not writing the story of my family. I'm writing the story of this town. If I run into documents that have to do with my family, great, that, that'd be very interesting, but I'm not there just to reconstruct my family history. Uh, it was very important for me on various levels to say that to myself. And only one document surfaced. And it, I, it, it was, again, one of those uncanny experiences, uh, as I was telling Lona earlier re regarding uh, Yevhen. Uh, I was sitting in the archive in Lviv with two Ukrainian research assistants, and they were going through all kinds of materials in Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, and I was sitting there going through documents in Hebrew from the 1920s and 30s by all kinds of Zionist organizations. And as I'm going through these big files, a piece of paper literally falls into my lap. And this is this brown paper that keeps breaking. So there's a lot of little pieces. And I pick it up. And that piece of paper has three names on it. And it says, these are the three men from Buchach who have been issued the certificate to immigrate to Palestine. And it's dated March, 1935. And one of the names on that is Israel Shimel, written in Polish spelling. And that's my maternal grandfather. Uh, so he received the permission in uh, March, 1935. In December, 1935, they uh, uh, boarded the boat in Romania and arrived in Palestine. That's the only document I have, nothing else. So as I said, my family does not exist in the documents. It exists only in stories, rumors, and not that many stories were being told. Uh, it, I needed to take the initiative in 1995 when my mother was 71 and to ask her about her childhood. And then she told me about members of her family, what she could remember. And three years, years later, she passed away. So that was all I had to go on and nothing in the archives. And of course, it's not an untypical story. I mean, so many of us. And I would say one last thing, because the, you know, many people over the years have said uh, things along the lines that, uh, but my family came from Poland or Russia or Ukraine or, or Lithuania and 149 members of my family uh, were murdered. Uh, and I was always, first of all, skeptical about how would anybody know how, exactly how many members of their family were killed because we know so little. And these were large patriarchal families and there's almost no documentation. And secondly, that statement troubled me because there is a kind of, um, you know, a sense of uh, it, 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 it gives you some importance in saying that, but you then don't actually do anything about that. You just make the statement and then you move on. So if it, it is so important to you that so many members of your family were murdered, uh, why not try to find out who they were? never mind how they were murdered, but who actually were they? And most of us don't do that, uh, in, including myself for many years. And so in that sense, I think if you really want to humanize that loss, you must at least identify not all the 149, but one, two, three people that vanished without a trace and try to give them a face, try to give them a life story and a death. 
exactly and this is where you know like history like as i was saying like uh, for everyone is not that lucky to have you know their family evidences and writing history becomes difficult and this is when a fiction is the best resort yeah and true like i have read your book uh, the anatomy and uh, and uh, regarding this region i have read also the books by sherry plokhi and uh, timothy snyder's bloodlands which basically deals with uh, the hitler and stalin's atrocities in the region but what i liked most about the anatomy was you know it's it de it details out about the socio cultural life and how the atrocities were linked to you know every day and uh, like it was internal rather than being external uh, fig uh, related to external figures yeah yeah I, I, you know one thing that i've thought about increasingly over the last 20 years or so is that when when you talk about mass killing uh about genocide um genocide is not only about killing a lot of people which it is of course but it's also about erasing the memory it's about uh, making the event itself the very event of the genocide then be erased from memory uh and so you can explain genocide say the holocaust uh and it's important to explain it from the top uh to explain how a state uh an organization particular leaders uh, uh decide that they want to carry out such a policy and then how do they enact it how does a modern bureaucracy carry out such a uh such a, a mass crime and that's important but when you're doing that you're usually doing it through the eyes of the organizers through the eyes of the perpetrators you're using their documents you're telling the story their story and in that way whether you like it or not you become complicit in a particular story of erasure and the only way to save the people who were murdered and whose memory was e eradicated is to tell their story and that cannot be told from the top and can rarely be told through from archives because people who are subjected to genocide don't have time to write documents and and file documents there were some attempts well known such as the onik shabbat the onik shabbes uh, archive in warsaw organized by manuel ringenblum who came from buchach was born and raised in Buchach, but in, in most cases, we don't have that. Uh, and certainly not for these kind of communities that were taken over by the Germans and people were not deported anywhere, they were killed right there where they lived. Uh, and so in order to do that, you need a very different historical perspective, not the one of Hitler and Stalin coming from the outside and killing millions of people, uh, which, of course is important to tell but what were the internal dynamics and those internal dynamics are not only the fact that people were uh, killed and their memory erased and the mass graves um, are, are not even marked to this day although they are buried around their own towns to this day but also that much of the violence was not only from the outside but also internal that the germans could not have carried out uh, these kind of mass killings without massive cooperation from within. In the area of Buchach and Choltkov, another town nearby, um, there were 20 members of the security police and they killed 60,000 Jews within just over a year. They couldn't do it on their own. They did it because they, they had an entire battalion of auxiliary police who were armed Ukrainian policemen and local police units in every town and that's how that could have been accomplished so quickly and efficiently uh, so in that sense it's not only something coming from the outside it's something that is part of the dynamic the social dynamic of these local genocides that put together give you a picture of the entire history that cannot be told when you're telling it from berlin or from moscow
Yes, exactly. And we are almost at the end of our session today. I would like to ask this question to both uh, Professor Bertov and uh, Professor Leona Talker that uh, when it comes to Holocaust literature, we are every day, like uh, nowadays we listen that it's, uh, it's it, it's history. Holocaust and genocides are history. So, uh, and there are no literature on Holocaust or genocide left. So, but th this is also a way which Professor Bertov has shown, like how when uh, history is limited and uh, when evidences are limited and gaps needed to be fulfilled, uh, fiction is the resort, which I said. So what should be the, uh, like, uh, what are the major challenges in these areas? And also I would like to know that what what the author should be careful about in writing uh, uh, historical fiction or trying to attempt these sort of things? Yes, sir. Ne Leona? <laughs> it's a very, very difficult question. But I'm sometimes surprised that all of a sudden uh, we do get new memoirs, authentic memoirs, uh, like very recently I read uh, a memoir by one Herman Cohen, who was from Elie Wiesel's town in Siget, and uh, who, like Elie Wiesel, was in Auschwitz with his father, and who reported more or less the same things, the same story as in Katsetnik uh, of a son who takes the punishment instead of the father. And he did that himself, uh, the sermon Cohen, and survived somehow. So from time to time, lo and behold, a miracle happens. When you think that there are no more witnesses, that there are no more documents or stories, some appear. As to the writing of fiction about the Holocaust, it's, it's such a problematic, uh, such a problematic endeavor. And I have purposely not dealt with uh, novels about the Holocaust because um, novels of the kind of, you know, Styron and uh, uh, Skirbel, Skirbel recently, etc. because uh, because of my very deep distrust of the motivation behind them. Though, on the other hand, when I read the poems of Mariana Kianowska recently, somehow uh, the suspicion of, of the motivation was not there. Somehow they, they seem genuine. Uh, Professor Bortov, would you like to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I, I agree with everything we heard now. Um, in terms of um, actual documentation, what struck me over the years uh, when I was doing research and reading uh, on, on Buchach and Galicia was that there is an enormous amount of testimonial material. Uh, hundreds, well, actually tens, thousands of uh, testimonies many of which have not been heard by anyone. Um, uh, just the, in the Shoah Foundation uh, in USC, um, the, um, some, something like 55,000 testimonies. Uh, and each of those, I mean, I had about 70 from there that had to do with Buchach. And each of those is an entire story. It's an entire story of a life. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. And many of those, no author, no fiction writer could ever imagine. Uh, and they're very vivid, uh, often told um, in, in, in beautifully. Um, 
And so there is actually a huge amount of material that has not been used. Uh, I could not integrate most of what I was reading into what I wrote because it's impossible, of course. Uh, and, and then there are, of course, um, um, memoirs that suddenly surfaced that we, we didn't know existed. In terms of fiction, I I totally agree, and that's why I'm myself, you know, ambivalent about the whole thing. What I I think as a historian, uh, what what I find beyond being suspicious of the motivation, uh, as Leona was saying, I I'm also I'm, I become impatient with people who try to imagine the past without actually having learned anything about it or very little. Uh, this kind of magic realism where it doesn't matter what Ukraine or Jews or Ukrainians or Poles actually lived like in that period, I'm going to just use the little bit I know to imagine a story that I think would be a good story to tell. Uh, so the motivation may be one type or another, but there's something in the, I'd say, uh, to put it less kindly, in the laziness of not actually studying enough that does not show respect for the period that you're writing about, for the people that you're writing about. Uh, and as, as far as I know, and I'm not a, you know, a professor of literature, but as far as I know, <clears throat> uh, great writers, uh, what, whatever it was that they wrote, whether it was historical fiction or other types of fiction, actually labored a great deal to understand the characters and to understand the times and the places about which they wrote. Uh, and when you do that, regarding the Holocaust, you are under particular obligation, I think, to do that. And that has not always been the case. Um, so that's where I think at least I can say uh, it, one thing, that, it doesn't mean that a novel would be good if you know very well what, you know, the historical background, but if you don't, um, then, it should be read with the yeah, with the degree of uh, suspicion. Yeah, I entirely agree with this. Indeed, uh, uh, Professor Basu asked what such writers should be cautious about. They should be cautious about having studied enough. But it, there is one uh, case of a person of a writer who has studied enough can't deny him that. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Littell, the kindly yes. ones. Yes. Um, and the novel is still a big problem. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's a very good example, exactly, of that you know a huge amount and you end up with something, especially the latter parts of it, uh, that is problematic to say the least. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Bertov and Professor Toker. It was a great conversation with uh, both of you. And I'm interested to know, like, what would be your next novel, Professor Bertov? Like, uh, is there any chances of sequel for The Butterfly and the Axe? Or is there going to be some other novel that would be coming up? So, yes, sir. Well, I'll say very quickly, no, no not a sequel. I don't know that I can have a sequel. Uh, to this one, but I, I, I am planning another book. It'll probably take me uh, a few years to do it. I, I have some rough draft, but it'll be something very different and it will take uh, place in, um, in biblical times. Um, so, um, and I'm, I, I love the Old Testament. I'm, I'm, I'm right now, among other things, doing my own translation of stories from the Bible uh into modern english uh and so it'll have to do with the period of um uh, samson and delilah all the way to king david <laughs> that's about as much as i can say about it right now <laughs>
Yeah, and Professor Toker, like, are you working on something? Well, right now, I'm very busy putting together a special issue on Kuznetsov for East European Holocaust uh, studies. As I mentioned before, Professor Ionescu, who is here, has written a, an excellent article for it. Um, but I need a break from these issues from time to time. So I'm also writing something rather extensive about Nabokov and about a certain uh, change of topoi in uh, English, French, and Russian novels. Wonderful. And I wish best, I wish uh, both of you best of luck with your projects. And for now, also to Professor Omar Botov for his uh, uh, The Butterfly and the Axe, we wish a great success. Mazel tov. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>